Hello, I'm Togat and welcome back to my second channel election video. This is something I like to do from time to time on this channel because I'm fascinated by the rules and the structures that basically determine where power is held in the modern democratic world. It's interesting to me and it's perhaps interesting to you what the world's second largest electorate is about to do tomorrow. Because after India, which of course has over a billion people, the European Union is the second largest electorate that votes on a single-ish thing, which is happening tomorrow. Over half a billion people are going to be represented by members of European Parliament who will elect a president of the European Commission. And here's the thing about that election, as well as not liking that it potentially exists, which is going to be a very big opinion, I imagine, in the comments. You're also going to see a lot of people who watch this video statistically don't care about this or didn't even know about it before today. I can tell that because most people aren't from the EU uh, and don't really care about it outside. And on the inside, people really don't care as well. Here's the turnout from the last eight elections. As you can see, it's kind of just steadily declined over time uh, because, yeah, it's seen as being weak and effective and it's not really something that's cared about on the same level as a national election. So speaking of, uh, you know, national elections, let's look at this, uh, you know, big stat of 43% of people vote. And let's look at that on a country by country level, because it can get real dire. Besides countries of compulsory voting, i.e. Luxembourg and Belgium, where it gets very high because you basically have to. Uh, if you look at all the other countries, you can see it gets lower and lower and lower to the stage where Slovakia has just over one in eight people voting in European elections. This is like, you know, crisis levels for a normal democracy, which I guess is one of the good reasons that it's arguably weak and ineffectual. But yeah, basically, uh, people don't vote in these elections. You probably didn't know it's happening. And you probably didn't also know that there were debates happening to determine who would be the president. Like, oh, you got to decide what your policies would be. They were in English, they were in French, they were in German. Do you recall any of those? You probably don't. So yeah, let's go back to the map of the European Parliament constituencies, because it's a fascinating election because no one cares about it, despite being the second largest democratic event that can happen at any given point in time. But as well as being fascinating on the level of like, oh yeah, some people don't even like it's a thing, most people don't vote, most people don't care. It's also interesting to look at the structure of the election, because although the European Parliament, ha it, you know, it's the first like, Europe-wide democratic body, it's also, I mean, it's not really regarded as those things, and also it's held on an individual level. The member states get to decide how they're going to, uh, you know, hold the votes. There's a few EU-wide rules like, oh yeah, well, you have to, you know, pick a party to align with, or, you, you know, there's a few EU-wide rules of like, oh yeah, well, you have to guarantee, uh, you know, that you're like, anyone from any country can vote if they're a legal EU citizen. There's a bunch of stuff like that where you can't deny people from other countries to vote like you can in certain national elections. But yeah, basically, looking at this map right here, you can see how the European Parliament constituencies also are very strange because why is it that France and Germany and Sweden are one thing and then Poland seems a bit divided and so does the UK and you might notice Ireland and Italy are also divided. You might not notice that Belgium is because, I mean, it looks that way all the time anyway, right? But <laughs> I want to talk about the divisions of the EU Parliament, because if you actually, uh, you know, look through, you'll notice that because it's held on an individual country level, each country can decide the voting method. Uh, we used first past the post at one point, and uh, in the UK, we've switched to, I believe it's the Hunt, we switched to, uh, you know, mixed member proportional, like a proper proportional system, uh, you know, system in the UK. And uh, that's interesting, because it's the only elections we have in the UK, uh, outside of Scotland and Wales, that are held in that same way. So interesting that there's a separate election system just for these elections in the UK. And second of all, there's the fact that, again, you can look at the fact that, like, okay, looking at the UK's uh, boundaries, I actually like this, like, you know, despite the fact that it's not cared about by most people, I've never voted in a European Parliament election. Uh, we can talk about what I'll do later. But, like, you can see how, like, oh, yeah, looking at this map, it's actually quite a logical way to divide up the UK as well, because looking at, like, and Scotland's up there, and uh, Wales and Northern Ireland, they're split off. But then it does something that is rarely done, and it's like, let's split England up into regions. They each have about seven or so MEPs, and then you vote on them proportionally. So there's still a local representative, but you get several local representatives, and there's always going to be one who probably agrees with you if you're one of the major parties. It's a really bizarre system, and it's the one which actually favours smaller parties the most, which is why the success of things like the Greens, or like UKIP, or like now the biggest parties in the form of the Brexit Party, is a thing you'll see a lot. But yeah, I just wanted to mention this real quick, that like, you know, the UK's uh, boundaries, I really like this because it's rare you see England actually split up into its subregions. We just kind of, kind of treat the UK like, oh yeah, it's England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. 
But England, you know, London has more people than any of the other three countries in the UK already. And it's like, how do we like actually address it as unique and somewhat like uh, like relative power blocks? I think this is the best way. Split the UK up into eight little regions, uh, and then that way you can actually effectively represent them. If we were ever going to have a Senate in the UK, which we did, we we won't. This would be a cool way to do it. So quick election rant about the UK there, but also you'll see how it's not just the UK. There's also Poland, which is split up in an interesting way. There's also Italy, which uh, interesting enough to me splits the islands separate to the rest. You can see that's what the zigzaggy line here means, um, as well as splitting the north and the south. It's uh, again, they don't have as many constituencies despite having more population than Poland, but still it's interesting that you can decide how to split your own country. So uh, Ireland has split it so many different times and so many different ways. Like now they've basically decided on like, okay, there's north, there's south, and there's Dublin. That's that's the way you can equally divide, uh, roughly at least, uh, power in uh, you know Belgium uh, in um, Ireland. And then the most interesting one to me is Belgium, where there's uh, you know three separate constituencies. There's the the Dutch North, there's the uh, Belgian South, and then there's the German East, which does get its own European Parliament constituency, and it's the smallest electorate in this entire thing, despite there being 500 million people being represented and 750 uh, you know, MEPs, you can work out on average, what is that like? Okay, that's a MEP for every 666,000 people, roughly. Uh, in this particular place, you can see how the votes that decide it are roughly 11,000. Like, 11,000 people can decide their member of the European Parliament. And yeah, this is one of those weird holdovers of, again, like, there are Germans in, in Belgium because they got some territory in exchange for being steamrolled during the World Wars. It's like a, it's a weird, like, remnant of all of that that then has its, uh, you know, uh, results here in the European Parliament. Also, so something you'll notice here is like looking at the map and how tiny a place this is, how few people live there, what a weird niche this is that gets their own representative in the European Parliament. You'll also see how on this map, wait a minute, France is divided there too, but you didn't speak about them. Oh, Toy Cat, you're such a logical inconsistency. Because here's the weird thing, uh, France actually decided to change the way they, uh, they, they represent themselves. They used to be regions. Now they're going national like the other, you know, like 23 other countries have done. And I don't know why I find that so interesting, but I do. It's an election that's held on a national level, except when it's not, except when it's held on a regional level or a sub-regional level or, you know, <laughs> on a country slash regional level. It's such a bizarre thing that the election varies from place to place. And it's something that most people don't care about because again, most people don't care about the overall election, but I find it interesting and maybe you do too. So. Things I also find interesting is if you look at the uh, results, so here's the uh, like kind of the Wikipedia page. I, if you don't know, read the Wikipedia page about elections. If you want to get like a base good overview, obviously dive more into any election you care about. But you can see, looking at like, okay, so uh, th th these are the people, their current seats, etc. You can see the European Parliament is very, very divided. It looks like, uh, you know, like an in India or like uh, any other huge uh, area where like there's no two-party dominant system, uh, you know, maybe like a Germany. And uh, looking at it more closely, you can see how like, actually, so you need 376 seats for a majority, and that never really happens besides if there's a grand coalition, except it's not a grand coalition because you can't really describe most European election things as grand. But you can see how like, oh yeah, so despite 376 seats being needed for the majority, no party ever comes close. If we if we zoom back a few elections, again, fun fact, you can you can scroll through and you can kind of see like the overtime uh, results and you can be like, oh yeah, it seems as though pretty much the entire time the EPP has been the biggest uh, party until you go back to 1994 when Europe looked like this, which, you know, like, it's crazy that, you know, in 25 years so much can change. But like it was 25 years since the last time they weren't the largest, and when they weren't, you know, even before then, they uh, the the PES, the Party of European Socialists, I believe, or it's meant to be Socialists and Democrats. So we'll talk about the parties later. But like you can see how like oh yeah, the the right wing party has been pretty much the largest party for the longest time, and that's why it's so interesting to me that. Euroscepticism is a right-wing thing. Like, you know, Europe is the big, you know, people call it the EUSSR, like, unironically, all the time. And it's like, well, I mean, no, but, <laughs> like, there are many things the EU can be, many negative things. But I don't think calling it the USSR is uh, quite fair. But, um, again, leaving that aside, it's like, despite the fact that Europe has become more and more of a right-wing represented organization, the hate hatred from it comes from that same right wing. It's a right-wing position in the UK to be anti-EU. Same in Poland, I want to say. Same in most countries. And although that, uh, you know, in Germany, in Sweden, I could list them off over and over again. In, in France. But, um, yeah, it's interesting because the European Parliament is, uh, the European Union, at least, is technically represented 
by that same right wing movement. There's like a there's like a weird split in the right between like pro and anti, and I still don't know for sure why that is. Like it it used to be that like it was the left that was really really against the EU because it's a free trade block of 500 million people, but now you can see it swing the other way, and I don't know what it, why I think that it's so interesting. But yeah, not only is the EPP the European People's Party uh, the biggest individual group again the the Conservatives, but also the ECR, which is the European Conservatives and Reformists. I want to say it was set up by David Cameron the UK Conservative Prime Minister uh, because he wanted to separate from like the pro-Europe guys. Basically, let's summarize it this way because there's three conservative or right-wing, let's call them, uh, parties which are in the like top eight that are in the, you know, like contention for helping decide the next European president. There's the EPP, which is like, yeah, keep the keep the train rolling into the business town of the EU. There's the ECR, though, like, let's slow down this train. And then there's the, the EFDD, Europe for Freedom and Direct Democracy, who are like, you know what? Let's uh, let's just backtrack this one a little bit. To, let's backtrack it all the way back there to before this EU thing. Like there's a there's a range of opinions in there, but there is like three major groups. Also, when you look at the left, it's the same thing. There's three major groups. There's the S and D, socialists and democrats. Uh, there's the uh, <laughs> it's called the G U E slash N G L. It's not really a thing in the UK, so I guess we don't get a British acronym. But it's basically the European Communists, and they do pretty well as it turns out. Like 52 seats out of uh, 751. And there's also the Green, which Again, green and communist, uh, you know, especially in the English world, seems to just like overlap a lot. But yeah, there should. In in my head, it's good that we have a green separate to like, you know, because it shouldn't be like, you know, I want to save the environment, so you're a communist. I mean. I mean, like, I, I don't want that to be the case, apparently. But apparently that's how it is in a lot of electoral systems. So yeah, it's cool that there's two separate groups there. There's also the ALD, which is, you could describe as being centrist, I guess, liberal, uh, you know, like, kind of democratic liberal. It's a confusing thing. And uh, yeah, basically my point with all of this is there are so many groups, no group ever gets a majority, and no one really ever cares about the particular groups. And that's why, going back to this debate, which of these guys do you want in charge? Do you want, uh, you know, the guy from... Um, I'm gonna guess this. I literally just looked at their pictures, but I'm assuming he's ECR, EPP, uh, S and D. This is the the communist lady. This is, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't even know. I I literally just saw their pictures literally seconds ago, and I can't. Did I get it right, by the way? Uh, I did not get it right. But you can see how like. <laughs> <laughs> you can see how, like, uh, despite this being a huge election, despite the fact that we're deciding a new European president, and the European president report is some of the reason people didn't like the EU, people still don't really care. And I don't even necessarily blame people. I don't think that's, like, a bad, like, oh, you guys should really vote on this. Because to swing this around to the end, so what's the deal? What's happening tomorrow? What's really being decided, Toy Cat? What is happening when all of these constituencies go out and vote? Well, one, we'll probably see uh, turnout be somewhere in this level. There's a chance it might raise a little bit in some countries. There are going to be a lot of countries where it goes down. So it's really like, does it go up and down as a whole? Who knows for sure? Second of all, in the UK, our largest party is, it's called, it's literally called the Brexit party now. Uh, it's it's, it's going to be winning this election. It's, it's not how much are they winning this election by. It's are they going to, sorry, it's not are they going to win this election? It's how much are they going to steamroll the election? Which is interesting because we're going to send people to the European Parliament that we don't want to send people to. But we're going to send them there to say, hey, stop doing our things. They're going to collect the salary and not do anything. It's a weird thing to me that like people are going to vote for that. But again, it goes to show that this isn't an election about... This isn't necessarily an election about, oh yeah, who's going to be the next president? I hope it's him and not a her. Is she is that, that looks a bit like a dressing gown. Is that deliberate? I, I'm not even sure. I mean, nice trainers, I guess. But, like, is it going to be her? I don't like her, but he looks, he looks, no, he doesn't look like, you know, of these guys, I, I, I don't know if I trust any of them. But you get my point. They're like, no one cares about this. No one cares about this. No one's like, oh, let's see if Southwest England flips or let's see if, uh, you know, like, I don't know, <laughs> Lombardy uh, decides to go, uh, you know, green instead of red. No one cares about any of that stuff. It's more, there is an election. I can go state some opinions on my national issues and it will go on a EU-wide level. And uh, yeah, that's fascinating to me that we have elections that are effectively not elections. And it's one of those crises of democracy if we're left like, not unlike in, in regular elections, you can argue that's kind of true, but there's always the swings back and forth that show that the issues really do matter. But there are no EU-wide issues that seem to swing the barometer. I am going to probably vote on the same level as my local level politicians um, because I, you know, when it comes to Europe, all of the blocks, as far as I can tell, even though I've done some research, it's like, they all seem to have very, you know, like you don't want to vote for one of the major two ones because they're both generally 
uh, like the the vote on everything because it sounds good or because look but like then the other small parties seem to agree on that too like every single country has its own version of the EPP of the ALDE and they can be good and bad and different and they don't seem to <laughs> my point here is I am voting in this I try to stay very politically informed I am some I'm someone who tries to dive into any issue but on this one it's just like man you just you just vote and you send a message and that's all you do this is an election where you're not voting on these guys or these guys or on on this you're voting because you want to send a message and it also happens to elect some people and it's uh it's a scary world for democracy when this is the case maybe i'm wrong maybe in like uh again maybe in, if you look at like uh the malters of the world or the Wait, I'll, I'll slide to the right so you can see. All the Greases of the world also has compulsory but not enforced. All the Italy's or the Denmark, they're like, eh, I cannot wait until they'll... I don't know why that's my Danish accent, but I cannot wait... Uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's going to be Indian, but <laughs> you can see the point. They're like, maybe they're excited for the idea of like, this is going to be the guy who represents me. But yeah, uh, I know who's going to represent me, but I don't know anything about them. They're not famous. I googled them. They don't show up anywhere, and that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's the state of our life. They, they don't even care enough to be Googleable, to be searchable in any real way. And uh, I don't know why that's interesting to me. But yeah, European democracy, weird times, weird place. I kind of don't want the personality-based system of the US. But also, is it much better when you have the exact opposite? We have, like, polarizing systems of, like, it, over there it's vote for the person you hate least. Over here it's vote for someone and who knows what it does. Is it better to be able to be ap apathetic? Or should everyone not be? I don't know, but I just want to say, go and vote if you live in Europe, uh, unless you don't care. I this is this is annoying to me. Whenever people say like, oh yeah, you should go vote, not if you don't care. I I recommend caring about elections. I recommend spending today doing some research. Like, oh, so let's look up some positions of the S and D or the Jew Nagil, because you know they might be really good. Is that is that a Venezuela thing around her? Anyway, but they might be really good. Uh, is that? I think it might be, right? I just spotted that right now, but <laughs> like you you might like their policies or you might like this guy. I don't like this guy. I mean like he's got a bit of a weird face. You might like any of these dudes. Vote from them based, you know, you might vote for this guy based on his teeth like, ah, oh, man, he has teeth looking like that. He needs the votes just to just to make that better. I don't know for sure. It's something you have to work out, decide. I recommend being informed and then looking up how to do this. But I wouldn't say, go out and vote. Like, I, I don't like the whole, just go out and vote. Yeah, it's important. Because that seems to send the message of like, vote for the people I'd like you to vote for. And, you know, I think it's better if you don't care, if you're not informed, don't vote. However, get informed and do vote if you can. That's my message. Hope you all enjoyed it. Second channel, don't care. Goodbye.